Why don't you just turn it so it doesn't make a noise? It doesn't. It'll continue. Do you have a number on top of that? What? Do you have a video on top of that? No. What? And yeah. I don't think anybody wants to eat. Well, hear me. Any, any treats today? Mm hmm. A lot. Oh. Did you see Maxwell? The photos? No, I heard a lot of treats about him. No. How many? I don't know. All of Pure I only saw one tree down, but a lot of huge branches. Does this not start till seven? Hmm. Well. <laughs> Jerry, I thought I thought your head was a picture like a fake person. <laughs> I thought Leo, you had like a mask of someone else. <laughs> it's so weird. That that would have been impressive. Um all right, I'm gonna get out of the way so the director can do his thing. <laughs> I won't go too far, I promise. Leo. Leo. I want to make, make sure this works because you just got me a new laptop. I was just going to say, do you want me to just do the screen? I can do it like this. And you can yell at me to flip a page. Okay. Let me go to the beginning. I'm pretty good at knowing when you're done. Okay, good. So that's how we want to do it? All right. Hi, Leo. Hi, Jen. This way, um, I, I get nervous sharing the screen because we did that. At, remember when I did it with Jason? And some, somebody else somehow got on? Yeah, that, that's fine. It works for me. Some outsider. Hey, Jenny. Hi, Jen. How are you? You know what I made last night? Pasta vazul. Chicken cacciatore. Ooh, that's oh, great. It was so good. You cook it in a uh, cooker pressure pot? No, but in like a Dutch oven. Oh, that's good. Oh, yeah, that's good. Sure. I put it on at like 9 in the morning on low, and we ate it around oh. 6.30. What, what parts of the chicken? Legs, thighs? Thighs. thighs. I did oh, all yeah. thighs. Oh, it comes right off the bone. Delicious. Look, Jimmy, look. Oh, that's great. You got any left? No. 
<laughs> and I even had oregano in it from some a little old Italian lady who lives around the corner for me was visiting her sister last year in Italy and brought me back. Oh, that's nice. Oregano that her, that her sister made. Hmm. Yep. Text, um, where is everyone? What do we have? Tiffany and I, me. You have me, Tiffany and me. Um, Emily. Oh, we are? I guess we're, well, Jimmy, do, yes. do, we, do we have to, um, nope. just start. Nope. no, we start as a committee meeting and if we get five of them, we have to uh, read the uh, notice. Okay. Perfect. All right. So who do we have? Who do we have? We have director Pellegrini who okay. will be doing the health and human services budget presentation. Right. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just sending a note to some other council. Oh. Um. Vanessa, Mike. Tiffany, can you text Ruben? Uh, Emily said she doesn't have a link. Get the rest of the paperwork. Jerry? Can you send it to everyone? Because Jim just said he can't find it either. So we're just going to wait like two minutes for everyone. Might as well. Oh, there's Emily. I have Leo's presentation. If you want to let me share, I can go through it for you. Or, or if you have it, whatever you want to do. I already put it up. Okay. Thank you, though. I'm sorry? Ruben's not joining. Okay. We have a quorum, so. Oh, Vanessa. Yep, and Russo's on as well. 
Yeah. Great. I wanted to give Jim. Jim should be, yeah, one. Jim's trying to join. He said okay. he's got the link. So he might just be another minute. Well, wait, you know what? I'll do the this way. He can just say here. <laughs> I would like to advise all those present that notice of this meeting has been provided to the public in accordance with the provisions of the Open Public Meetings Act and that notice was published in the Jersey Journal, Journal City website. Copies were provided to the Hobo Reporter, the Record, the Newark Star Ledger, and also placed on the bulletin board in the lobby of the City Hall. Written objections, if any, shall be made to the City Clerk. Please try to salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible. With liberty, liberty, and justice for all. all. Let's go. Thank you again. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Huh? Mr. Cohn, Mr. Fushko, Mr. Doyle. Present. Mrs. Falco. Here. Ms. Fisher. Yeah. Mrs. Jabor. Here. Mr. Ramos. Mr. Russo. Here. President Gentino. Here. Okay. Up. So they can hear me, right? Yes. I'm gonna there we go. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. I can start? Yes, thank you, Director. Uh, first of all, good evening, Council President and Council Members. Um, tonight I'll be giving a presentation of the 2020 um, calendar year uh, budget. This is my 12th consecutive year of introducing a budget. Um, it feels like uh, 2009, 2010, when we went through so many challenges. And uh, sure enough, we're, we're back to, uh, again, dealing with a lot of challenges this year, but uh, I think the department has done really well in overcoming those challenges. So uh, I'll go through my presentation now. You could take it to the next slide. Department of Health and Human Services consists of the, these divisions, which is obviously uh, the director's office, which is my office, division of health, division of senior services, division of rent leveling, uh, recreation and cultural affairs. The next slide you'll see um, the org chart right now as it stands for 2020. Obviously you have the director, I have a, you have a graphic artist. On the, the board of health, we have one health officer, one uh, chief registered environmental health specialist. We have one registered environmental health specialist, one registrar, an agency aide, and one clerk typist. In recreation, we have a superintendent, one supervisor, and a recreation aide. In uh, senior services, we currently have a division ed, two keyboard clerk twos, one principal clerk, a laborer, and uh, two uh, part-time uh, uh, bus drivers. We also have two, uh, one senior aide and a community uh, aide as well. In the rent leveling office, uh, we currently have just the rent control officer, and in cultural affairs, we have uh, one cultural affairs uh, administrator. So we can move to the next slide. I have a question. Your, uh, we going on, as, yeah, as slides go. So your department seems significantly understaffed. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Because you have three individuals for recreation and we have approximately how many youth in, in this uh, city and programs that you run through recreation? Through recreation, um, you know, it varies. Soccer, we have about 1,400 participants. Basketball, about close to 900. Baseball, close to 900. Football, we have about 125 that play uh, uh, Pop Warner football. We have flag football that has increased over the last couple of years. We have Close to 175 uh, participating. Um, so I think I covered most of the your your, your, your main sports. Director, can you um, can you just talk about how many people you lost, like in the recent? Yeah, if we, go, if we go to if we go to the next slide. Yeah. 
So here you'll have a full head count. So basically you lost seven, uh, seven full-time employees and two part-timers. So if you, if you look at the org chart, there's no longer the, uh, obviously I don't have my admin. Um, in recreation, we lost uh, two employees. In health department, we have lost two employees there as well. You notice that there's no deputy registrar. Um, rent control, we lost two, uh, two, two staff members. So in total, we lost, I lost seven and two part-timers. Um, uh, Jason, Director Freeman, can we get a, an actual summary of the departments and who we lost? Not their specific titles, but just kind of as Director Pellegrini just outlined. Um, at, at this point, I, don't, I have to tell you, I don't even know how many people ultimately we lost, how many people, and that includes people that were forced into retirement um, instead of being laid off. And can we just... Brad, did you say something? No, it was something about Facebook and YouTube. Okay, so can we just, can we just get that summary so we can have a sense of where the, the losses occurred? Um, I knew, I personally knew that broadly under the Health and Human Services that this division uh, was hit disproportionately versus others, but I actually am surprised to see that they lost nine, effectively nine employees, um, which is 30% of the employees in some pretty important uh, divisions for our city. Um, so can we get that um, summary of where all the losses have been? Sure. Thanks. Who said sure? Did Jason say that? Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. It sounded like Rod again. <laughs> I was like, uh, okay, no. well, thanks, Rod. <laughs> I'll defer it to Rod, not a problem. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Director, you're telling me that you, for, for every full-time employee you have, they're responsible for about 1,200 children each? I mean, if you break it down full-time to number of children in our recreation programs? Yeah, so again, we got, we, we got so much support from our seasonal employees as well as the organizations that run, uh, that run those leagues. So... Uh, there's a lot of volunteerism that goes on in, in athletics, especially recreation. So you have your volunteer coaches, you, you have your volunteer organizers. So even, even having lost two, two additional people, um, you know, they, they need to be at those facilities to make sure that everything mm -hmm. runs smoothly. Um, but even in the past, you couldn't run all of these activities with just the, the number of people you have in recreation. Yeah, I'm, um, so I'm you, need that, you need that that support staff uh, to, that that runs the, these uh, uh, sports act, you know, athletic activities. Yeah, I'm I'm just I'm I'm more concerned about how we have three people for all the fields and all the recreational buildings, and I mean, how are they all running at one time? I mean, are they bouncing from location to location? Yeah, I mean. Uh, Again, because of the uh, pandemic, we haven't had a full-blown recreation. So I, I currently am not really impacted. But once we go full-blown with, with all of our activities, it, it's going to be challenging. Um, you know, I'm going to have to utilize more of the seasonal employees to kind of like make sure that all of our uh, – someone is at all of our facilities and making sure things are uh, functioning properly. So, like I said, we haven't really had a full blown out uh, recreation in the last, you um, know, last several months. So I haven't really felt that impact yet until we, we again, we open up fully. Yeah, I mean, it's just a drag. If you look at over the last ten years, there's a drastic reduction in your department. Uh, it's concerning, actually. Director, um, in the depart in the divisions that you only have one, like rent control and cultural affairs. Is there someone that backfills that person if they're on vacation or out sick? Uh, uh, no, I mean, right now, 
I'm um, depending on, uh, well, for let's say cultural affairs, for example, um, for cultural affairs, we could have someone that, uh, that's, that's kind of like a part-time or seasonal that could help. But obviously if, if we, if we lose someone like Cherry, it's going to be very difficult, you know, to replace, uh, immediately. And rent control is the same thing as well. I had made, um, I had, uh, discussed this years back where I felt that, uh, rent control really shouldn't be in Department of Health and Human Services. I always felt that the rent control should be either um, in the tax office or uh, community development. I think community development is probably where it should be. Um, and having done that research years back when I was running two departments and I was kind of like wanting to consolidate and making sure that, uh, you know, we could, we could make, you know, adequate um, improvements in, in service, I thought that was the best way to go. And I think um, because of the, the cuts, I think this year, I, I think we need to really consider moving um, rent control into community development where they have more personnel that can make sure that the residents are going to get the proper service services that they need and also make improvements like going online, like making other improvements that uh, the, the uh, rent control officer will, will need. Um, so that's, that's, you know, we're, we're working on that internally. We have discussed it with, um, you know, director Brown. Um, so we're looking to kind of like move that forward in the, in the coming months. Roger, I'm muted. I'm, I'm muting him. He's muted now. <laughs> <laughs> Is that stuck on the screen? Can you guys see the other screen stuck in front or no? I, I just see the presentation. Perfect. Um, Director Freeman, what what's the administration's uh, position on rent control in terms of only having one person effectively staffed to this? Well, again, as Director Pellegrini said, we've begun the conversations of looking to restructure per his recommendation. I know it's something that he's been um, discussing for a number of years and we've had the conversation with director Brown who is open with it and feels as though there's probably a better marriage in his department than there would be in health and human services overall. So with that, there is a number of, um, just kind of staffing adjustments that we would like to make and probably hopefully the second half of this year going into next year where we have a fuller looking staff in, in the office of, um, rent control uh, under Director Brown and community development um, so that we have as high, highly functioning an office as possible. Why, why are there synergies? Why would there be synergies with community development and not have this be in the tax assessor or elsewhere? Because it has an, I think it has an affordable housing component to it. So in my research, that I've done again years ago. It's it's uh, a lot of municipalities would either have it in tax office or community development, and the other area they would have it in is the city clerk. And I disagree with it being in the city clerk's office. Okay. How many uh, how many rent control units do we have in the city? About. I don't have that figure with me. But the same, the, a similar analysis, let's say it's 10,000 or something, a similar analysis to what Councilman Russo is saying about the recreation department. I mean, we, we it, although different because there's no supporting staff, we basically have one person running the department right now until these changes are made to handle, you know, thousands upon thousands of, of rent controlled units. I, I feel like, you know, this needs, if the change is going to happen, it should happen like ASAP. This is a significantly understaffed department for the needs in our yeah. community. And this, and right now more than ever is when we're feeling pressure and landlords are trying to recoup additional costs because everyone's hurting and we need to have as many people around rent control as possible from now until the end of the year. So even yeah. if there's so a I, kind of temporary solution, yeah, um, I, so to, to your point, we are uh, aggressively moving to ensure that, you know, we're going to move this quickly into that uh, department so it, it could be staffed adequately. 
So this is not something we're going to wait until the end of the year to do. We're, we're actually, you know, we are actually going to start moving forward probably at the next council meeting to introduce the first reading to move it from health and human services to community development. And we're going to start that process. So this is not, we're not going to wait till the end of the year. It's too late for that. Uh, we need to, we need to act immediately. Okay. Thanks. Got it. I would just like to add to that quickly that there were a number of items that were um, prioritized and discussed within the um, subcommittee and in regards to rent control and um, becoming digital, becoming an accurate account, having an accurate count of the exact number of properties, um, looking into uh, the challenges that we face with condo conversions. So there are a list, and this is, you know, reiterating what Councilwoman Fisher said, there are a list of items that are priority and should be priority to this administration, but this budget presentation is not reflective of that. I think we're three slides in, so. Well, I mean, the first slide, well, I missed the first slide, the second slide or whatever slide that displays how many employees that the department has is enough, especially when there are people, I mean, that's not, I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. I mean, okay, that's, so that's enough. Thanks. Uh, so the next slide is the breakdown of, of this year's budget. Um, for uh, the, the, my office, it's 227364 Rent control is 236885 uh, Recreation is at $531 and $228. Uh, health is $552,200. Uh, senior services is $330,531. And cultural affairs is $125,789. The next slide is going to give you a breakdown of what that means. So as you can see, the 227, 364 in, in um, the director's office, 221, 564 is salary and wages, and O&E is 5,800. Rent leveling is two, 236,885. Um, the salary and wages line is 215, uh, 085, and the other expenses is 21,800. As you can see there, there's a 17% decrease um, health department is 552200 The breakdown is uh, salary and wages at 471793 Other expenses are 127548 um, So there's a decrease there of 7, 17% as well. Some, some of the money, that, the decreases in O&E, I was able to use a trust account for some of our contracts, like Liberty Humane, uh, which produced some cuts. Uh, senior senior uh, services, we have 330531 Salary and wage line is 324531 And the other expenses is 6000 because of the reduction in a lot of activities that are going on at the senior center. Leo, uh, or director, yep. what is the, if you look at the 2019 budget versus the 2019 paid or charged, what is in the senior citizens line? It looks like it is seventy thousand over budget, seventy eight thousand over budget. That's all depends on the services that that ties into our our grant with the county. So if we go under the certain services, we don't receive grant money. So we, we we need to budget that. So that's why that number is the way it is. I don't. So I don't um, yeah, I didn't follow. So. The, I know that we have certain appropriations that have match grant funding. Is that what you're saying? So yeah, exactly. We budgeted, we budgeted 321, and then we got an additional service for 77, so we had to increase appropriations. We had to increase appropriations because we didn't receive enough of the uh, grant funds to offset what we initially had appropriated for. So how did we, we didn't receive $78,000 of grant funds? That's a big number. Yeah, I'm not, I don't believe it's, it's 70,000 because the grant itself, 
is a hundred and twenty five thousand. So uh, I'm not that number I got from finance. So I'm not I'm not so sure. Okay. Um, Can why we- it's sixty to seventy? But I could I could look into that. Great. If we could follow up and understand yep. that 2019 budget to paid, um, that would be great. Okay. In recreation, we have uh, 531228 uh, Salary and wage line is 391528 Other expenses are 139700 And there's a decrease there of 16%. Um, in total, uh, this year's budget would be two million three three thousand nine hundred ninety seven and a thirteen percent decrease uh, from the twenty nineteen uh, budget. Director, could you uh, just go over cultural affairs there? What what's the four and a half percent increase? Just salary. What um, what what's the salary increase for? Is that the one so, individual? The, the it's, director, a, it's a the director. Yeah. So it's the one individual and just that's their con- contractual increase for the year. That is correct. Okay. And then, and then just overall, I, I, it looks like there's been a significant reduction in all the, um, in all the lines combined. Was that mostly salary? Cause you didn't break it out with other expenses. You just had the other expenses uh, for 2020. Uh, and the combined number for 2019. So, yeah, most of the reduction was in sal- salary and wages. So, again, uh, in the O and E side, for example, we're looking at uh, if you look at recreation, that 139 obviously is not going to uh, all be be spent. Um, so, there could be f- uh, further reductions there. That's pretty much the only line item. Health department, um, there's a lot of contractual services there. Mm-hmm. And the other two departments, there's really not much of O&E. Did they, did they stay relatively the same, though, is, is really the, the, the question I yes. have. Yes. Okay. And then re- recreation, I think that's just one we should look at um, as, as we progress through the year because if, if we could – I mean, even if we could save twenty, thirty thousand dollars, that's twenty, thirty thousand dollars that we save. Uh, it's something that we should really just watch. Yeah, we we are watching that as well. I actually got an updated. Uh, I looked at the updated number for this year, and there's significant amount of money allocated there. So we we could definitely make some cuts there. Yeah, director, if you don't mind, if if you could share that with the council, what you think that number is really going to be. Um, just so when we're going through the budget line by line, we could make uh, some determinations as to how we want to fund that line. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and director, just for clarity, isn't cultural affairs another department that only now has one employee in it or does it have two employees? Just one, just one right? Just one. Okay. There's previously a part-time person there. That right. Yep. The next slide just basically shows the, the tr- various sports and the trust accounts and what the balances are in those, uh, in those accounts. Um, as stated in all other budget hearings, uh, the monies that, that are received for each individual uh, sport uh, get spent for, for that, um, for that you know, sport as well. Uh, going forward, we probably want to uh, look at uh, increasing in some of these areas uh, to decrease the O&E. I, I think a lot of people um, would not be against that um, because the, the fee is so low in, re- in relation to uh, all the other municipalities. Go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, well, I'm sorry, just really quickly. So the receipts are the $25 fees that you've collected essentially. Correct. Got it. Okay. Thank you. The next slide just pretty much shows the uh, the revenues that we received from health department, which was two two hundred nine thousand one hundred and sixty, and rent leveling forty five thousand five forty. 
Go you to the next know, slide. I know one of the, isn't there a, a registration fee that people should be paying for um, their uh, rent controlled properties every year and we're generally not collecting that? Is that true? Yes. yes. Well, I'm sorry, what's the question? Isn't there a registration fee that um, all the rent controlled units have to pay every year um, that we're not collecting right now? Uh, I'm not, I'm not so sure what, okay. what the, you know, if you're saying that some, some people are not paying it, is that what you're saying or? No, I, I think, um, just in general, isn't there, there's a fee that we charge to have for all rent control. Right, exactly. Registered every year. Right. But we, it's but because all are not registered, we don't collect the amount of fees oh, that's, that we that's what you, potentially could yeah, yeah, because exactly. they're not properly registered. Yes. Right. Yes. And that, think, that's, yeah. that's why we discuss going online. Right. Because right. And well, not only going online, but also, but also chasing people to collect those fees. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and again, when we've been working the last, it's, it's kind of like waiting two years to, to get on this, uh, spatial data logic to have helped us. And uh, unfortunately, um, it, it hasn't happened. Um, but hopefully going forward, yes, it certainly needs to be, there needs to be better software to, to help with this and make, make it much easier. So as far as uh, cultural affairs concerned, a uh, very disappointing year because a lot of the things got, a lot of our activities and events got canceled. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem like there's any uh, light at the end of the tunnel. But um, one of the things that we are uh, going to do this uh, so, uh, in the fall is have drive-in movies. So at least people can go out, um, you know, and, and go watch a movie. We're going to partner with the Business Center. We've been discussing this with uh, Greg Delaquilla. What we're looking to do is have... Uh, right now, I think we're, we're, the dates are gonna, what we're going to do is have it on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, have one movie for those three days. Ha make sure that it's ticketed. If you go one night, you can't go another night. And this way, we'll we could get as many people as possible. We're looking to test um, test it next week with our with our projection uh, projected that we have, and see how that works. I don't know if we're going to have to build a platform to get it higher so be, you know everyone can be able to, to see it um so hopefully um everything will work out well and we'll have this uh for the fall for our residents so and we're we gonna have a combination of movies for adults and also for uh families as well leo? I my idea i like it hey leo you're uh, gonna need it councilman russo you're gonna need a u-haul <laughs> your family that's right <laughs> Leo, um, yes. you considered, am I, can you guys hear me? Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, have you considered setting up the screen in the ShopRite Park at 11th and having it face south and maybe working with ShopRite to, you know, that end of the parking lot might be able to be used for that's a great uh, idea. A venue. It's a great idea. That, that's a, that's a good idea as well. We could um I could have a, I could call uh, um, CEO of Insera and see if he'd be open to it. So it's a it's, that's a good idea. Shoprite doesn't close until eleven p.m. though. No, no, I know, but I think if you pick the right day of the week, you know they they don't fill the parking lot to capacity at nine o'clock at night. You know, I would think. But that's why I'm suggesting it as a... Right. As a I regular. mean, not maybe not a Friday or a Saturday, but maybe like a Tuesday or something, you know? What the hell? Might as well close a few streets to do it. We do that. Can we arrest <laughs> a few city council members, too? What? Nothing. I was, I was addressing Mr. Councilman Russo. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so now we'll get to... Um, you know, most of the work that's that we've been focusing on this year um, is COVID related. So um, I haven't publicly thanked the, uh, I wanted to thank the mayor for making me the lead on the task force, but I also wanted to uh, 
recognize those folks that are on a task force that uh, worked really hard. And I think we had a great team. And that's why I think um, we did a great job early on and also when in the height uh, of COVID-19. So uh, I'd be reminisce if I, if I didn't mention them because I haven't done it publicly um, to, um, you know, OEM coordinator uh, and Sergeant uh, Willie Montanez has done a phenomenal job in making sure that uh, every, everyone's needs are met. I've been working close with him and seeing how, whether it's the housing authority, whether it's senior center, whether it's the, the testing site, he was all over the place, but uh, he he made things happen. So uh, I totally appreciate that. That team was was phenomenal. Um, from PD, we had obviously uh, uh, Chief Ferranti from the fire department. We had Chief Crimmins um, from the ambulance corps. Uh, guy with so much experience, Tommy Morfa. He did a phenomenal job. He also had, um, you know, he also had outsourced uh, ambulance from ambulance corps from Indiana during that time to help us. Uh, also from the hospital, Ann Logan and Brian McDonough. Um, one of my favorites, she would say, she's always rocking and rolling from the homeless shelter, Jacqueline. She did a tremendous job. Uh, who, uh, from the schools, Christine Johnson, um, Dr. Johnson, I should say, Director Recco from the Housing Authority, um, Richie Gutch from Port Authority Police. Um, I hope I don't miss anyone. Um, oh, uh, Stevens Institute, Beth McGrath and, and Maggie. Um, last but not least, uh, my staff. Tremendous, tremendous job. Can't thank them enough. Again, I said it early on. Uh, the passion they bring to the table is just extraordinary. Uh, Lynette Medeiros um, and uh, Nancy Tarantino and the rest of the team did just a phenomenal job and they continue to do a phenomenal job. Uh, we are very lucky. Uh, as you saw in my budget presentation, uh, we, not, we don't have quantity, but we have quality. Yeah. So I am so, so grateful for that. So uh, I just wanted to thank them because without them, we wouldn't have been successful. So it's a great team effort. And also uh, the, the city council as well, you know, uh, thanks to Councilwoman Giottino and all the council members that uh, were on the calls every day, giving you updates. Uh, so I, I you, you know, you were concerned about the community and uh, you know, you did your part, so thank you. So I wanted to thank everyone. Thank you, director. So as we stand right now, um, we're at 666. Ominous number. Yeah, I know. I think you so, should just fake it and just at least change it. Just make it 665 for a day. It'll go up anyway, but it's such a creepy number. You know, it's funny. It stayed that way for the last three days. I don't know. It is not, very creepy. It's not funny. It's creepy. <laughs> so we'll go to the next slide. Actually, okay. the important part about this slide is also the uh, how many have fully recovered. There's 619, so that's a really good number. We'll go to the next slide is the gender distribution. We you have, have the number again, 305, excuse me. I said you had to put the number there again. I know, I know. <laughs> 305 uh, male, 361 female. That's so, that's so interesting because wasn't it in the beginning, didn't they say that males were disproportionately higher than females? Yes. Yeah. That's so weird. Except Hoboken females. Yeah. Next slide. This is the uh, age uh, breakdown from zero to six. You see uh, 16, we have eight. Um, you see the largest is between the ages of 17 to 40. Uh, 17 to 30, you have 177. 31 to 40, you have 174. Um, 41 to 50, you have 84. 51 to 60, you have 73. 61 to 75, 97. And ages 76 and up, you had 40. So. Go to the next slide. So the mortality rate stays the same. It's been the same for quite a while now. It's 29. Uh, as you can see, the older age, older age bracket was impacted. Um, most, uh, um, hundred percent had underlying health conditions. Um, you know, and unfortunately, uh, uh, they passed. So, um, we feel bad for them. Um, and their families. So we'll, we'll get to the next slide. So 
so we continue doing our, our testing. I was uh, one of the one of the good notes about our, our testing was being able to go door to door and, and do testing for our seniors. Five hundred and twelve seniors were tested. Um, only eleven were, were positive. So uh, I think we, we've done a, a great job in keeping an eye on our senior population. Director. And, you know, in the in the next go round in the fall, if we need to, we, um, we we'd probably need to make a, another run and, and testing our seniors in, in the buildings. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Riverside is continuing uh, to test. We're gonna uh, we're gonna make an announcement. We're gonna do some uh, additional testing to kind of like catch up. Uh, we we had so many people that want to get tested, so we we're, we're gonna be going back to to Jackson Street. And we're, we're going to have additional tests there starting uh, next week. So look out for that announcement as, as well. Director, I know we, um, I know we uh, contracted with Riverside. Do you remember what the rate was per test for those that were uninsured? I believe that the, the number was one anywhere between 125. I think it was 125 to 135, if I'm not mistaken. Was that when we purchased the test or was that for them no. to administer the test? No. So when we, when we purchased it, it we, purchased, we purchased the test for um, uh, $50 a, a kit. $50 a kit. And then they were charging money to administer those or they were doing that gratis? No, they were doing it. They were they were charging through if you had insurance and whatever other whatever cost uh, if you weren't insured, we would pick up the the tab for that. What was the dollar amount that we were picking up for uninsured? Do you remember? It's about one twenty five. That was that was in addition to the fifty dollars. Correct. Okay. I'm sorry, but for the insured, if we were purchasing the test, is there a way that we were getting refunded for that? So we that, that mo Leo, I, I don't mean to interrupt. that model uh, was our that was the initial plan until Riverside was able to procure their own tests. So we initially in the council uh, allocated, I believe, fifty thousand dollars for us to purchase test kits. Um, initially, we only spent about eleven thousand yes. dollars. Um, and then we basically ended that contract and then switched to Riverside's model one. That, and that's when we were able to move to the 15 minute rapid test. Yeah. So, yeah. So the reason why we, we had stop and we, what we did was we didn't want to purchase 2000 test kits at the time. Mm -hmm. So we negotiated that we would only like, uh, Jason just, just mentioned, we were only going to pay for the ones that we used. And that, that was the reason behind it because we thought that there was going to be a better product that, that was going to come, uh, come, come, come through, and that's what happened with the rapid testing. So that's why we changed the, changed the model. But uh, for the most part, if you're insured, the insurance company should, should 100% pay for all of those expenses. Mm -hmm. So there shouldn't be any burden on, on, the, on the resident. No, but the, but my, my concern, Leo, and the reason I asked is we spoke about it in our insurance commission meeting as well. Uh, if there was a uh, if there was a difference between non insured versus insured, especially for our employees, uh, what that number was and uh, how we should proceed with that. Right? Any any medical procedure, you're going to get a customary and usual rate for that reimbursement. Um, so and and that's very different from a uh, non-insured rate. So that $125 for a non-insured individual is going to be very different from an insured individual. So I was just trying to figure out if there was a major difference between the two and if we could, if we could realize some savings uh, either on the non-insured side or our insured side. See if we could save some money where oh, we yeah. get a reduced rate. So, I guess the, if I can follow, so how many, how many times have city employees been tested by Riverside? Do you know? Do you have that total? I, I don't have that total. I don't have so it. Let, so let's say it's, I'm going to say it's 500, right? It's a, because we know a number of them have done it um, multiple times and probably not everyone has, has. And to Councilman Russo's point, assuming they're all um, 
they're all insured because they're all on, on the city's insurance. Are we being charged like two fifty a person no. because no. that's no. the insurance rate? Being, the okay. city being charged through insurance. I think the number we got from our third party administrator is somewhere between seventy seven and eighty seven dollars um, on the insurance side per employee. I thought yeah, it was a little high. I thought it was in the. I thought it was ninety eight, but or or eighty nine. You might be right. Eighty nine. Yeah, I think it was. I thought the number was eighty. It was in the eighties. It's like eighty eight, eighty nine. So that's what. So, councilman, that's what the. That's what our insurance is charged. Right. Being that we're self insured, that's what we pick up. So, what we've been trying to do with Riverside is see if, essentially, if, if, an uninsured person is getting tested. Riverside ends up making more money than a, an insured um, employee. employee. Right, but not a, an insured regular person, non employee. That's, that depends, right? Negotiation with their insurance company. Yeah. Um, so, what that's what we're trying to do is see if we can, and we've been working with them to try to reduce that number to make it even. And I know Councilman Russo um, and, and Director Landoffi and I in the self insurance fund meetings have been discussing that if we can work with Riverside to get them to charge all uninsured people the same rate that the city's insurance is getting charged. Which is a reduction. Correct. If in fact it's at $125. Correct. Right. Hmm. So yeah, I, this was one of, um, I think one uh, amazing program um, that we were able to initiate here in, in, in Hoboken. I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone in the world has done what we have done here in Hoboken. And it, it's, uh, it was a collaborative effort with the city, um, the Hoboken Community Center. Through our city meals initiative, we had over 77,000 meals that were given to seniors over a period from April 10th to May 22nd. It was just uh, amazing. Um, I can't thank the volunteers enough. Uh, without them, it became a family, right? We had volunteers stationed in, in each of, of these buildings. Um, I also like to thank the council members that participated uh, in, in each of, of your wards. Um, but I also uh, like the, the partnership that we have with the Hoboken Community Center and what Tony Tamarazzo has done it is just amazing. And I know um, there were council members there that were involved, like Councilman Fisher, Councilman Chitino, Emily Jabor, you know, Councilman Russo, um, Councilman Ramos. Everyone was was doing their part, and um, you know, they started three twenty five up until seven thirty one because I got some notes, and they five thousand three hundred seventy one households have been have been provided food, and seven thousand ninety four, which uh, equates to 7,094 residents. So the, the food pantry has done a tremendous job and they continue doing that um, <laughs> by providing meals. Tomorrow's another drop off for them. Um, we've also worked with, um, we, we're continuing to, to provide meals for our seniors um, with our, our volunteers that want to continue doing it. Um, uh, in particular, I'd like to thank uh, a couple of volunteers, uh, Joe Bronco and Aaron Foreman, who, who's a sh they, they're cooking. Uh, meals at the multi-service center every week. We we issue we give we, we provide the food to one um, one building. We went through already a whole round of of buildings. Um, we're going to be starting up next next week again. Also, uh, I think uh, Tony Tamarazzo is really happy that we also partnered with the um, Hudson County Community Food Bank project. Um, I should say community food bank uh, produce project. And last week we delivered produce to every single senior building. Um, and that project is every two weeks. So we're going to be able to provide produce to those senior buildings. Um, and I could increase that number. I've been talking to uh, the community center and finding out how many other uh, residents that, that are in need. And I could get more uh, produce for those families um, that obviously are requesting need through the Hoboken uh, Community Center. So, um, again, I'd like to thank everyone. We did, a, I think Hoboken did a phenomenal job. And, um, you know, it, it seems like we, it's not over yet. It feels like it was going to be over, but it seems like we're at halftime. So, so we, we got another half to go, I think. But uh, I just want, I would be, I wanted to thank everyone for that.
Director? So, okay, go ahead, Jen. Oh, sorry, it's Emily. Um, oh, Emily, I'm sorry. I was just going to add one person to the list of thanks, um, which is oh, I know Rab Carol Rab Jack? Uh, Caroline Caulfield organized a lot of those Ooh, initial sure. volunteers, uh, and so I just want to make sure we add our thanks to her as well, because she did a great job. Yep. Director, I don't want to put you on the spot, <laughs> but I'm going to. Um, do you think that there is a possibility that we could possibly host a socially distanced uh, bingo? Like maybe at the 7th and Jackson location where the tables are spread apart, the doors are wide open, and we just have an early evening. <laughs> I know you're smiling, but you're growling inside. But maybe we can talk about that offline because I think it would be a great opportunity to get some of our senior citizens out, yeah. socially distanced, obviously, um, to take part in an activity that I know that they miss um, before we go back into... Uh, yeah, I mean, I was I was looking at the multi service center and, and thinking about doing it at the the rink. Uh -huh. And every time I try try to pull the trigger, I, there's something instinctive that says getting all those seniors together there is not going to be, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a risk that I'm taking. So uh, there's a part of me that wants to do it, and then there's there's that instinct of saying, you know, we're, we're taking this risk, and do we really want to put them at risk? We've been so good right now. And I, I would hate to be the one that, you know, if someone was to get sick, I, I wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, sleep at night. No, I understand. Thank you. Director, um, last year we had put money in the budget to acquire two new vans. I know one was acquired. Have we acquired the second one yet? Actually, actually, I was, I have two that are still pending um, and I've just had, we, we were going to purchase the, the two vehicles and I, um, th there's documents that those vendors needed to, needed to submit regular city, you know, documents and they refused to sign. I literally have the two vehicles and, and, and Jason could confirm this. He sees it all the time. They're impending. I have two orders, um, that, I, I can't get these vehicles purchased. Can we then maybe switch and do a different vendor that's willing to provide it? And, and I, I don't think there's, I don't know that there's an immediate urgency, like it has to happen tomorrow, other than the fact that one of the vans, both the vans were originally basically about to fall apart. Yeah, no, I, right? So yeah. having the second van, you know, hopefully as we get into the end of the year and the beginning of next year, we are going to start being able to support our senior activities again. So having it ready and just having it done, um, I think would be great to do. Yeah, actually uh, it, right now is not my priority, but it, I, it's definitely it's definitely there. There, there. There's funds for two vehicles, so we're gonna have three. Um, and like I said, I, I literally, literally have a, a, a purchase order for it and they won't provide the, the necessary documentation um, that that's required, um, but Anyhow, the documentation isn't really uh, that complicated, uh, but unfortunately those vendors don't want to provide it. But uh, like you said, I'll be looking for other vendors. I'm sure someone is going to be in need <laughs> of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, get moving their vehicles out of their lots. Yep. Best deals are uh, New Year's Eve, so. Okay. Last but not least, I, I just wanted to just briefly touch upon that. Not only that we, we did so many so many things for our you know our community, but also we were the only ones that were um, driving Red Cross. We had blood drives going on in the city of Hoboken. We had eight uh, blood drives um, in total. Lives that were impacted were 954. Um, I would like to thank uh, John Faramoska, um, who's a resident and organized um, with the Red Cross. Um, and Anna Rapoli from the Red Cross, and also to uh, um, this was one of um, her, you know, uh, her initiatives, uh, Councilwoman Jabor, who helped organize these uh, blood drives. So uh, thank you. Um, and that is. And to Vitalint as well, Director. What? Vit uh, it was both Red Cross and Vitalint New Jersey are the two different companies that both provided yep. drives. Director, can you talk a little bit about? the recreation programs, just um, kind of where we stand on things, uh, what 
what programming we're expecting as of right now coming into the fall. Um, what's been, you know, set aside that we're not moving forward with. I mean, what we did, we ended up starting up uh, baseball. Um, girls softball is, 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 is um, having activities now in the summer as well. Um, a fall, it, it's going to be very difficult because we, we have a, a late start and all the directives that were, were given to us. Um, soccer is going to be extremely difficult uh, to do because of the number of, number of children that participate. Just don't have uh, enough uh, fields to, to ensure that you're social distancing. With soccer, we have multiple fields, but we split those fields up into – into smaller, uh, small sided fields to accommodate, um, you know, so, so many of the kids that participate. So it's very difficult to do. And not only that, if, if we, if we kind of cap it, I think it's going to create more problems because then uh, there's going to be a lot of kids that are going to be left off. But the way we, we run soccer, um, there's no way in, in this current environment that we can do that. But is there, um, is there an opportunity to do something where we, we look at it differently and maybe it's not a, and I'm not familiar with the specifics, I'm just going from my own memory, but, you know, let's say it's one practice, one game a week for 10 weeks. Can they do something that's more like maybe it's 10 weeks, but it's just having one practice or a game every other week so at least kids are – getting out and participating, but maybe it's not a full 10 game season. Maybe it's like a five game season, right? Like everyone gets 50% or everyone gets 40%. So that to your point, we, we don't have enough fields to be socially distanced. If everyone has a more traditional, you know, full season, maybe we can, whatever the, the math is, maybe it's cutting it in half or cutting it by a third to give people at least some sort of partial season and the ability to get out and these for the kids just to be able to get out and do something, you know, safely. Right. I mean, one of the things that we were considering um, is having just the older starting at the older with older age kids, because it's easier with the younger kids. It's just too chaotic. Um, uh, and it's just, like I said, it's just too many kids on, on a field uh, at, at once. So to program it is, is just extremely, extremely difficult. But, you know, I could I, I can look into it and see how, what, what are the best options that, that we have that we just don't follow it the way we did it traditionally, but just to get some kids out on a field just, just yeah. to, to, to play. Yeah, and, um, or, or maybe not even play. Maybe it's just getting them out on the field. Yeah, yeah where it's training, where it's easier to keep them kind of in like lines or doing drills or something where at least they're out and, and, uh, and maybe less chaotic. Yeah, we, I, I don't we know. Look, but, I was thinking, we were thinking about opening the registrations just to see how many people would want to participate anyhow. Like you, you don't really know how many would actually want to participate. Some of the folk, people that I've talked to, it's like 50-50. It's like some don't want to participate. Others are okay participating. But that other 50 that wants to participate, you know, well, how are you going to do things differently, you know? Yeah. They know they're not going to go to Mama Johnson and have six fields with, you know, hundreds of people on a field all at once. So um, we, we, we're we really tight right now um, to get something done like a league. But we could organize where, you know, kids can go on a field. The fields are going to be available. So – to, to your point, if you if you did something that uh, is mostly clinics and drills and not games, that could be something that we, we yeah. could probably do. And I think you just you just gave yourself the answer, right? Which is yeah. in, in lieu of having full seasons, the city of Hoboken is just going to run a series of clinics, you know, kind of quasi clinics, and it doesn't have to start September eighth ish. Maybe it starts yeah. October first, and maybe yeah. it goes for six weeks. But I think we have to make the assumption that the kids' lives are all going to be disrupted at least through, you know, the end of the year. And so whatever we can put in place as providing recreational services to the kids in Hoboken, I think we need to think outside of the box and come up with something as, as opposed to nothing. I'd also like to add that um, Leo and I spoke about a running club. So I'm saying that again. So I think that that's a great, 
a great activity that we can implement. It doesn't exist in Hoboken. And we can start out with different age groups, preferably like the, the I'm not sure what the age group should be, but we could definitely design different routes and start Why having. Does it exist in Hoboken? Well, maybe we could get Kelsey. For we could get Councilman Doyle to help with his carriers. Yeah. It's been around for 25 years. No, but 150 does, members. Yeah. Does it, for youth? Does it have kids? Does it have youth, Jim? Youth are, well, she didn't say that. They, we have That's events, true. but we don't have a youth running club. No, she, she, I knew that you meant children. Right. No. I, I didn't, I, I didn't hear that part. When you said different ages, I thought. We offended that, oh, no. Councilman. We, we <laughs> know your, we know you, your right. heart's there. Jim, I think, no, Jim, I think the Shenander Club project. We've worked on, project. on a youth, youth running series in the past, but yes, obviously, you know, running at 8 o'clock at night is not, when the adults run, is not as, as yeah, I, but I think it's a great idea, uh, Councilwoman. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim, you're going to spearhead it? Jim is going to, yeah, Councilman Doyle is going to be the lead. He's going to be like the Pied Piper and lead all the kids through Hoboken in the middle of the day. <laughs> that's a, that's a feeder program for his, uh, for his club. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Director, yep. That's fine. Director, how many children did you say participate overall? You had 3,500. How many? 3,500. In everything? Yeah. Because your, your receipts number, right, is 250. That's a question. And if you divide it by 25, the fee, that's 10,000 people. 10,000 oh, fees, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, some people might play base. Are you okay. counting yeah. baseball, soccer, and mm -hmm. basketball only once? or No, they pay for each sport. They no, no, I know they pay for each, but when you're, we're coming up with the number 3,500. Those are the bodies. Three times that. Yeah. Is there anything else in there besides the fees? Well, if you look, no, if you look at the, so what, what is your, what is your question? You said your, it was, your total number of receipts is $250,000. Right. That I'm just roughly just, let's say it's 250. That's 10,000 fees collected. So you have a lot right, more. You, yeah. You probably, the, the problem there is that in, in the summer fund, you have Art in the Park, which is which is forty five, and mm -hmm. then in in your adult programming, that's that's pretty much for rentals. So you're you're getting one hundred and twenty five an hour. Got it. Rentals. Yep. But Art in the Park's not on this page, right? No, it's in Summer Fun. Oh, got it. So if you were to take the sixty, if you were to take the sixty seven out, roughly seventy, you're at one hundred and 80,000. So to your point, it would be 187,000 ish, 70, 7,200 people. Fees. Yes. Which would be, I mean, remember, a lot of the kids don't pay the fee too, right? But some kids play so multiple sorts during the year. The individual child might pay three fees if they play right. baseball, yep. soccer, and. <laughs> And some kids pay no fees. So somewhere well, I, in there. My point is that may, I think you may have a lot more participants even. Right. Than 3,500. Hmm. Leah, what, uh, um, sorry, director. Soccer, what's the age range for rec soccer? Start at five, five to 13. I'm only saying this because I've had five-year-olds, so I kind of like your idea of the older kids. Um, it's gonna, it's very difficult. <laughs> it's parent, I'm probably going to want to be somewhere near the field, if not on the field, and right. they really do super cluster together in soccer, in particular. Yeah, like it's what baseball I think is probably a good. A better option for the like that age range. I'm just talking COVID times, not yep. Right, no, I agree. Um, Leo or uh, Director, just um, switching back to rent control again. In your <laughs> um, costs for rent control, 
we've had this conversation every year about having money available to do some sort of program that puts our records online. Is that in your budget this year? We are, we already budgeted for that in previous years. Okay. Uh, so like I said earlier uh, in the presentation that we contract with spatial data logic and we just haven't finalized um, you know, that we haven't finalized the software and everything else, uh, internally, but, um, similar to the, the health department as well, uh, for the dog licensing, uh, that, um, I'm awaiting as well, which is much closer, uh, to being finalized that we can finally have those dog licensing online. And hopefully by the end of the year, have the, before the year starts, we could have the business licenses online as well. So, is um but even if we budgeted for it in the past and didn't spend it isn't it don't we lose the ability to spend it like at some point it just goes into surplus so we have to no no because you you what you spent the money on already is what you already uh is the product itself you, you just have to you just have to implement, implement it. it right no 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 yeah, i know exactly. but the but the implementing is actually more of what the concern is because we probably have nine gajillion paper records that have to yep. somehow be scanned, read, OCR'd, and put into, um, because they have to be scannable. It's not just putting files in there, but somehow right. creating records. Yeah, there's got to be, there's got to be some, some kind of document workflow. You're right. right. Correct. And so that's my point is, do we have, budget dollars for that, the implementation of the project? I think that the implementation is going to come from staffing. That was the whole goal of moving it to community development. So in order to make these enhancements, uh, you're going to, you're going to need staffing. So uh, that is why that that's the last piece of it. So I think the, the software is there is just need to, to finalize it implement it and then you're going to have to make sure that you have you put it in an area where um they have adequate staffing to to um finalize this or and automate, or, and or, automate the, it well. or to hire interns or whatever yep. to actually do it um so i guess we'll have that it, i'm assuming then i mean how how do we look at this so we're looking at your budget right now and it's sitting there, but we're about to next week have the community developments budget put in front of us. And I, and I feel like between now and next week, somehow next week, there needs to be like a page in that budget that talks in that presentation that specifically talks about the plan for. Yeah. It's got to talk. We're, we're going to have a plan on how we're going to, what the transition is going to look like. Yeah, I'm saying from a from a budget standpoint, um, this is more to Director of Freeman right now. I, I think there needs to be a page in community development next week added about what the plan is in terms of when he when you talk about the staffing for community development within that team, what percentage of whatever staffing is on that team is going to ultimately be allocated to rent leveling as well as the implementation of the automation of our records. Like it, if, if it's not in, in Director Pellegrini's budget presentation, it needs to be in Director Brown's budget presentation. Understood, okay. Hopefully it's not complicated because we're having this conversation. I don't, I think it's just putting some words and a framework around it and, and, and just thinking through, like, how do we implement it and really looking at his staffing? Because if his staffing has capacity to do it, it's great. If not, then we should identify that maybe we need to hire 10 interns for three months or something like that on a part-time basis to actually do the scanning. I, just to, as a point of reference, um, uh, Director Freeman, um, you, you may want to just ask, like, Pat Carcone um, about what effort was required to get all of their zoning files and maybe even Ann Holtzman, what, what effort, hours, et cetera, was required to get all the zoning files online. And then I would also recommend talking with Chief Ferranti who 
they up they moved all of their paper files online a couple of years ago and they actually did it in house. And this, so this is part of the conversations that we've already started. So you're great. on the right track and great wholeheartedly. Great. And and then whatever we can do to make this a priority this year, I think is gonna benefit everyone and this is the year to do it. We we can't wait any longer. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and come in and help scan if people need it. All right. We had a, um, oh, they're gone. We did have someone there, but they left. Anyone else? Nope. All right. Thank you, Director. Much Thank appreciated. You, director. Thanks, everyone. Motion, Motion to close. Just, wait, just really quickly. The last. Oh, there you go. The la no, no, no. The last presentation um, is going to be on the 10th, um, which is next Monday, I believe. And this is going to be three. Um, community development was moved from tonight until then. So for everyone who's on this call, anyone who's watching, that's a critical one. That is all the planning and development in the community. Um, environmental services is another one that is critical to the community. Um, everything relating to uh, parks, uh, street cleaning, snow removal, et cetera. Um, and lastly, it'll be the first time we're presenting on our water utility. Um, so this will reflect the water deal that we did last year. So I hope everyone can uh, make, a, make it a priority to join next week. Actually, actually, I have one more thing. Critical to our community as well, considering the, what he's been doing for the last five months of COVID, oh. But. oh yeah no no no. of course i wasn't I, this wasn't relative to today's i'm just announcing what the next ones are so of course health and human services has been critical and thank you leo for or dr pellegrini for all of your efforts to date jimmy what were you saying actually be director of pellegrini can i in in closing I know this was uh wait uh, if you can do it in closing can, i'm, I'm going to say something first so you can have the closing perfect um, while, while we're all here together, special meeting with closed uh, okay. session. With what? Is anyone available? Say it again. Special meeting with closed session next week. Uh, 83 Willow and Baker building. Is that a no? No. Yeah. When though, are you I'm oh, I'm sorry. What was Special meeting with regard to what? Russo, you're meeting? muted. We remember at the last council meeting, we wanted to ha have closed session on um, the Baker Building redevelopment at rehabilitation right, right. area. Yeah, and I think Councilman Cohen couldn't make it because he'll be away. So he has to do it before our regular scheduled meeting. On the 19th. Right. I'd much rather do it on, on the one 19th. day than have a special meeting, but that's just me. Yeah, no, that's fine. I just wanted to get a pulse. And we do have, you know, we're missing at least two council people on, on one, two, three, four, five. I know, but yeah. Okay, no, that's fine. All right, the floor is yours. All right, yeah. thanks, Director. Hold on. <laughs> All right, yeah, I, mean, uh, I, know it's, I know it's been a difficult year and a difficult budget year, but you know, I, I gave a lot of thank you to a lot of people. Um, but I wanted to really thank uh, my employees that retired and did a phenomenal job and uh, provided great service to the city of Hoboken for, for many years. Uh, I didn't get a chance publicly to thank them for their work. Um, so I, I, this is the opportunity that I have um, since we're talking about finances and stuff like that. So uh, I'd like to thank Mary Ann Valenti, just a phenomenal, phenomenal worker. She's worked here for the city of Hoboken for over 30 years and just did a phenomenal job. Just want to let you know that I, I miss you. Um, Joey, Joey Cassetta, when we're talking about recreation, um, all the kids know him, all the families know him. Uh, he's done, that's, that's what he was all about. He's done a great job. He worked for the city for over 25 years. So I want to thank him for what he did. You know, you're, you're successful because of the people around you. You make changes, they adopt a change, and, and they're part of the team. So the, these folks did that. Same thing with... Uh, Sandra Dorch, uh, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, woman. She worked for the city of Hoboken for over 30 years, did a phenomenal job in the rent control office uh, under my leadership, but she worked in other departments prior to that. So uh, again, I miss her dearly as well. And, and Gina O'Connor, who retired as well. So I, I hope they're all doing well. 
but I wanted to thank them for the service they provided to the city of Hoboken. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Thanks, Director. Motion to close. Motion. Second. All Second. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.